Welcome to all of you who are joining us, whether you're joining us live or you're watching this later as a recording. We're delighted to have you here. My name is Naomi Hoffer and I'm the program manager for the Sherry Sobrato Brisson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program. And this Living Well with Brain Can Cancer webinar series is a segment of our growing survivorship program that we've started uh, at the UCSF Neuro-Oncology Department, thanks to a generous donation from Sherry Sobrato Brisson. I'm delighted today that we're going to be discussing a topic that is of much interest to our patient population, and that is the ketogenic diet. Now, I just want to say off the top that we're not necessarily recommending this diet and promoting it, but we do know that many of you are on this diet or interested in this diet, or you've heard a lot about this diet and are curious to decide whether this might be right for you. So I'm so happy that we are able to offer this and have some speakers here today to talk with us about it. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today's webinar. Natalie Ledesma is our featured speaker for this topic. Natalie and I go way back, probably 18 years, when we first worked together at the UCSF Cancer Center. And she has over 20 years of experience as a registered dietitian, and she's a board-certified specialist in oncology nutrition. Natalie is the Clinical Nutritional Specialist at Smith Integrative Oncology in San Francisco, and she's the Founding Dietitian for the Nutrition Program at UCSF's Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm really honored and grateful to have her and her nutritional expertise and wisdom uh, in our discussion for this topic today. And I'm also thrilled that we have Chad Findlay here with us to offer a more personal perspective on the ketogenic diet, and we'll hear his firsthand experience with it. And we'll hear from Chad directly after we hear from Natalie's presentation, and then you'll all have a chance to get your questions answered via the Q&A function mentioned earlier. Okay, Natalie, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Naomi, and happy to be here virtually with all of you um, and to discuss the ketogenic diet. And in this situation, sounds like uh, many of you have already been uh, trying this for some period of time, although we do have some that may be watching this recording in the future who have not yet tried it. So I'm going to kind of put it a percentage of a perspective of kind of wherever one may be that it would hopefully be useful information to, um, to help. So first of all, we want to be able to establish what exactly is the ketogenic diet. And a ketogenic diet is one that puts you in a state of ketosis. This is a metabolic state in which your body uses ketones as the primary fuel rather than using glucose, which would be more the standard. And this occurs when we are fasting or when we have a very low carbohydrate intake where our blood glucose levels do not meet our energy needs, in which case the body then utilizes either fat in our diet and or breaks down that fat to produce ketone bodies for energy. And we have three ketone bodies that the ketogenic diet will lead to the production of these, and those are acetoacetate, not that you really need to know these, but just in terms of having some background, um, BHB or beta hydroxybutyrate, that's your primary ketone, and acetone. And these are all uh, produced you know, you know, by the liver. So essentially, for the ketogenic diet, we're looking at a very, very low carbohydrate diet and or fasting components that then lead to low blood glucose, break down the fat to form the ketone bodies in the blood, and that's where we lead to ketosis. So where did the ketogenic diet come about? And uh, Dr. Warburg, back in the uh, 1920s, he observed that most cancer cells, regardless of oxygen availability, will metabolize large amounts of glucose and convert it to lactate rather than oxidizing it to carbon dioxide. So this inefficient use of glucose countered by an increased rate of glucose uptake is called the Warburg effect. And I think Chad may speak on this to a tad uh, at the end. So how does cancer come into play? Well, it's hypothesized that unlike normal cells, cancer cells cannot use ketone bodies for energy. Uh, and if we restrict our glucose, we restrict our carbohydrate consumption, then the thought is cancer cells may slow, stop, or simply starve. 
Another theory is that ketones may actually be toxic to cancer cells. So if we're in a state of ketosis where the, our ketone values are higher, then perhaps that would cause changes in our genes that are involved in tumor growth that would uh, inhibit our, the cancers from being able to grow any further. Definitely more research is needed on the relationship of cancer and the ketogenic diet. We know, of course, there's an increased uh, interest in targeting cancer metabolism as an adjuvant treatment uh, for cancer, for, th for diet therapy, uh, and the emerging research in animal and limited case studies, we certainly, like I said, need more research, but limited human case studies suggest that a ketogenic diet may stop or be able to slow or inhibit the growth of tumor cells while also protecting normal, healthy tissue. So the traditional ketogenic diet is actually 90% fat with our combination of protein and carbohydrates comprising the other 10%. So this is the standard traditional ketogenic diet, but I would say that this is not what I, is predominantly used today. Um, but this is kind of where we look at as the standard ketogenic diet. <clears throat> Um, which typically has a ratio of four to one, meaning four times the amount of fat as the combination of protein and carbohydrate. <clears throat> the modified ketogenic diet, which is where most people do generally tend to follow, is where most of you are thinking along the 70% fat, 20% protein, and 10% carbohydrate. I would say from an oncology perspective in particular, this what I think would be a healthier um, you know, profile to follow because this is gonna ensure that you are getting adequate protein. At 8% protein, we may definitely fall short and given higher protein needs, sometimes with different types of treatments and so forth, I think the modified ketogenic diet would be a wiser approach than the standard ketogenic diet, particularly in the, in the eyes of oncology. And then just to kind of um, show a difference here. We also oftentimes see the modified Atkins diet, which I know does have different um, phases, but is generally 60% fat, 30% protein, and 10% carbohydrate to can have a few comparisons. This slide here, I just wanted to show that um, you can kind of look at the ratio of the fat to the combination of the carbohydrate and protein by some of these different types of um, protocols. But I also wanted to show on the right there, the carbohydrate allowance in grams per 1,000 calories. So if you are following a 1,000 calorie diet, a 2,000 calorie diet, 1,500 calorie, we would of course adjust those numbers um, accordingly. But essentially, you know, we're looking at probably having you know, fewer than 50 grams of carbohydrate if following a classic or modified ketogenic diet. Uh, on this slide, this just helps, well, how many calories are you supposed to be eating? Um, certainly you could work with um, your dietitian to be able to truly personally, you know, personalize that to determine it specifically for you at this particular time. This is a very generic, um, you know, chart that you could use just to give you a ballpark idea. Um, you could even go online and find some individualized formulas that will plug in your height and your weight and your age and your activity to have a little bit probably more of a personalized, um, you know, approach, you know, that way, but just to have a, you know, a sense. Okay. I was going to say, we have our next one, right? We have a next poll now. Yes. All right. So for those of you who are, um, familiar with the ketogenic diet, you may have a bit of a head start on this one. Um, so we're going to ask you what type of sugar substitute is permitted on the ketogenic diet? Is it um, artificial sweeteners, aspartame, saccharin, maple syrup, honey, or stevia and monk fruit? Which do you think are the permitted types of sugar substitutes or sweeteners for the ketogenic diet? I'll give you another Five seconds. All right. All right, I'm gonna end the polling now. And here is, most of you said it was stevia monk fruit. We will find out. Thank you. And most of you are indeed correct. Um, so this slide, you can see some differences. We oftentimes hear of the keto diet, we hear of the paleo diet. 
the Atkins, I feel a little less now than we were hearing about this, uh, you know, 10, 20, even, you know, even back in the 70s as well, where Atkins diet was bigger. But we definitely see keto and paleo quite, um, quite frequently. And um, I would say that stevia and monk fruit, yes, would be approved uh, with the ketogenic diet because, of course, they are not in, uh, you know, increasing any or con contributing to any calories um, to the diet, particularly any carbohydrate calories. Um, you could also use stevia and monk fruit with a paleo diet, but also you can see there that the raw honey and maple syrup are allowed. And you can use this to kind of have a little bit of the, you know, see some of the differences and similarities between these different um, protocols. The biggest thing is that only the ketogenic diet puts you in a state of ketosis. Um, so others are going to still have fats, are going to still have proteins, are going to have carbohydrates to limited amounts, but only the keto diet truly has one in a state of ketosis. So let's do a few comparisons here of the ketogenic diet versus your modified Atkins. And the ketogenic diet is definitely a high fat diet. Um, preferably, I would utilize avocado and olive oil medium chain triglycerides, coconut oil. Um, I'm less of a fan of using some of the animal fats, but technically these would be included along the lines of heavy cream and butter and mayonnaise. This diet also is going to be, uh, you know, your protein needs essentially are calculated um, because you can only have that, you know, 20% if you're doing a modified or if you're doing a classic, you know, even only 8% of the calories coming from protein. Um, carbohydrates are going to be limited to small amounts of vegetables following the modified ketogenic diet. Hopefully that allows for a little more of a moderate consumption of the low carb types of vegetables because generally my, at my MO is to go for lots and lots of vegetables. Um, <clears throat> this typically you're using kind of the keto diet calculator to help uh, formulate some of the macronutrient um, percentages of kind of how your diet is falling out. And oftentimes we are strictly weighing food to know specifically how much is this in grams so that you really are in a state of ketosis, particularly in the early times when you're getting familiar with how this diet, um, you know, how many grams of this would, you know, would calculate out to be 8%, 10%, 20%, you know, 70% and so forth. Uh, and Chad can weigh in after following a ketogenic diet uh, you know, later on where, you know, we see, okay, after following it, then you really have to still be weighing food or can you, uh, are you able to kind of eyeball a little bit more closely, you know, once you're really familiar with this. Um, additionally, we certainly want to monitor labs um, because the ketogenic diet has one in a state of ketosis. We do want to make sure um, that everything is looking good and beyond the ketones. We also just want to keep an eye on kidney function, um, you know, liver function, make sure somebody's well hydrated um, and, and more. In the modified Atkins diet, typically we're measuring food in cups and ounces. Um, generally, the food, you know, your carbohydrates are going to be limited to less than 50 grams. It could even be more uh, in, the, in a ketogenic diet. Protein is essentially unlimited because um, it's not just a high, it's not a high fat diet. It's a high fat, but also has a substantial amount of protein. Ketogenic diet is definitely a high fat diet. Um, this, a couple of these pictures are just mostly to help illustrate like what does it look like if you're not familiar with following a ketogenic diet of what some foods would look like in this situation. I think these look, you know, relatively uh, appealing. I thought, so I did find quite a few examples on the internet that did not look appealing uh, whatsoever. Um, here is kind of a seven day, uh, you know, picture, you know, of some, of a, of some meals kind of what that would look like. And you can see in all of these, there's a considerable amount of fat, whether that's eggs, avocado, and I'm guessing potentially even, you know, some sort of mayonnaise or white creamy substances. You see a lot of um, oils and or butter or, you know, other kinds of fats that are in, um, you know, these different slides. And this slide here um, is showing you just as an example, you know, how would this look for a 14 day meal snack uh, kind of menu plan. And I wouldn't say that I would agree that these are wise options, but just to have a sense of kind of how this would look, I wanted to go ahead and incorporate uh, this slide too to give you a sample. So one of the key things is we need, if we're going to be in a state of ketosis, we need to measure our ketones. And there are different ways we could go about doing that. One way could be measuring it via our breath, which is going to measure acetone, uh, not our primary um, ketone body, but definitely one of our ketone bodies. 
Um, we could also do this via urine strips. This indicates levels of acetoacetate that are excreted in our urine. This one definitely is generally kind of known as the least accurate, but oftentimes is used the most frequently uh, because it's very easy to do. Um, and probably from a one week perspective would be a le the least expensive option versus buying some of these different meters, which could be a higher cost upfront. There can also be some false negatives with the urine strips. And the most accurate way would be doing a blood meter where you can really measure ketones and particularly measure that most pre, you know, prevalent uh, ketone body of beta hydroxybutyrate. And there are some different things. If you have questions in terms of you know, costs of different ones, you know, we could definitely look at that um, as well. Um, this slide helps to show when we are truly in a state of keto, what we call keto adaptation, that this happens when you're in this zone for several weeks consecutively. And kind of giving you an idea, if we have our blood ketones and we're measuring those, where do we want them to be? And you can see, you know, basically that we want those to be under um, three millimoles. Uh, and we don't want to go too high, particularly in terms of ketoacidosis, particularly if we're in a diabetic you know, scenario that could be very dangerous you know, for one's health. So additional on the testing for the blood meters, a couple, I'm certainly um, you know, happy to have more insight and, you know, and thoughts from all of you at the end of this presentation. Um, but the precision extra blood glucose and ketone meter was one that um, you know, I saw a lot of people um, really liking even more so the keto mojo seemed like it was even liked um, a little bit, have more kind of higher ranking. Partly that I think was because the strips for the precision extra were quite expensive. Um, for breath testing, I seem like one of the ones that were frequently recommended was the ketonics acetone breathalyzer. Uh, and then for urine testing, um, seemed like the highest reviews were coming from the Nurse Hattie Keto Strips, just to give you a few brand names if you're looking to see kind of where do you start to measure ketones. So our classic ketogenic diet, if we look at some pros and cons, one of the thoughts is, does this have a potential of improving prognosis? Uh, and of course, while this is unknown at this time, um, you know, we are looking at possible, you know, benefits here. Um, additionally, this helps to lower our glucose, which is generally going to be a good thing, not meaning where we have too low of glucose, but a low normal blood glucose value. Um, it has been shown to be used safely uh, in other types of populations, particularly under medical supervision and regular lab monitoring. We've also seen lesser edema and angiogenesis that was found in mice. Angiogenesis, for those that are not aware, that's the process of creating more blood vessels, basically to help, which could fuel the growth of a tumor. So hence having less of that is a positive effect uh, in lines of cancer world. And then also less seizures. As some of you may be familiar, the, the ketogenic diet um, was originally used particularly in those with epilepsy and has been shown to be very effective for those patients. Additionally, from a con perspective, it can be very challenging to follow because it is a highly restrictive diet. It does need to be carefully planned, uh, and that can sometimes be a little bit more, you know, too overwhelming. Um, there are some potential side effects that we will discuss. Oops, and here we are. <laughs> um, so these side effects, I would say, some are going to be more in the acute scenario, kind of the ones I've listed there in the beginning at the top of the slide, and then others would be things we'd be listening at more from a chronic um, side for using this for a year or beyond a you know term of a year. So initially we want to think of how are we handling things from a gastrointestinal perspective. Constipation sometimes can be a factor if we are significantly lowering um, carbohydrates and sometimes the fiber can go down uh, considerably just simply also the, the significant change uh, in macronutrients that you're consuming. Um, weight change can be a, a, a factor that could be a positive factor for some that could be negative for others. So we can certainly make sure we are consuming adequate amounts of calories to help lessen the likelihood that weight loss would occur if that's something we don't want to happen. Um, definitely as we transition from using glucose to ketosis and ketones, fatigue and just kind of overall sluggishness is very common. Um, additionally, nausea, more so than vomiting, but definitely nausea and those, again, kind of that GI related challenges can be an issue as you're transitioning 
from using the glucose to ketones. Once you've been on a ketogenic diet, um, generally that I don't find that is the case. Um, low blood sugar, so we want to make sure that we are balancing blood sugar. Now, sometimes ketogenic diet can actually be beneficial so that one is not having too high of blood sugar, but we also want to make sure that we're not bottoming out and going too low. And that could be manifested by kind of some shakiness and feeling very unsteady on your feet. Um, from a longer term perspective, we may want to make sure we're monitoring kidneys. Um, looking potentially for kidney stones, um, but more so just overall possible renal damage. Um, we also want to make sure that we are using a multivitamin, multimineral, uh, due to the limited food options, um, to make sure that you are meeting your nutrient needs. In a perfect world, I really like to measure all these different nutrients so to know particularly for each individual which nutrients do we want to make sure that we are focusing on. Um, on the long-term basis, it could lead to a higher values of cholesterol and lipid labs, um, could possibly lead to a deficiency in carnitine, which is uh, an amino acid or metabolite where that helps to shuttle fat into the mitochondria of the cells, which is kind of your engine, if you will, for those cells, and could also lead to the loss of bone mineral density, uh, increase in the potential for osteoporosis. So there are some side effects, both acute and chronic, we want to keep in mind. Um, whether or not, you know, the ketogenic diet weighs more heavily or less heavily, that's an individual decision based on a variety of factors. One other that I do want to mention too, from a long-term basis is, and research I think will be coming more to this um, to illustrate this, but I do think that one of my hesitations is how is the ketogenic diet going to affect your microbiome. And as you have likely been reading, the microbiome is pivotal for our health and related to virtually every aspect of our health uh, beyond just simply our digestive function and our gastrointestinal system, but most definitely immune function and more. And what happens is if we have a diet that has, for example, very low carbohydrates, lower fiber, then we may end up generating less short chain fatty acids, for example. Short chain fatty acids are the key fuel for the cells of your colon. They are an inverse relationship with colon cancer, for example. And yet if we don't have enough fiber, we may not generate enough short chain fatty acids and that could create you know, a more altered negative effect on our microbiome. That's just one example, but those are things I wanna certainly mo monitor and look at commensal bacteria and look at these values for those that do, in, do decide that this is a good diet for them and they wanna pursue it for a longer period of time. We can measure these different values. So again, how would we go about, why, why would we wanna be able to use a ketogenic diet? Um, how this may be beneficial, possible mechanisms of study that could be included. One could be that we have less available glucose to our tumor cells, that we have fewer pathways and signaling hormones such as insulin, insulin-like growth factor, or uh, protein kinase, activated protein kinase that promote cancer cell growth and survival. We could have a lesser cancer cell resistance to chemotherapy and radiation. So maybe our chemo and radi radiation would be able to work more effectively. And it could also increase tumor immunosuppression uh, by increasing some of our anti-tumor cytokines and increasing our natural killer T cells. And then lastly there, that we could possibly see a reduction in inflammation that is induced from radiation therapy. So these are some of the clinical ways we may see a ketogenic diet being beneficial. If we look at a few research findings, we're not going to uh, belabor you with too many studies here, but <clears throat> we do see that a ketogenic diet may lead to a lower amount of hemoglobin A1C. That is essentially a marker that measures your glucose over the previous two to three months. It can also show us having a lesser uh, of lower value for fasting glucose, a fasting insulin, possibly greater weight loss, enhanced mitochondrial function via increased demand for fat oxidation. We want to have a good amount of mitochondrial functioning because that's going to be key energy for your cells. Um, the second bullet point here, um, just looking at uh, a trial, looking at evidence was inconclusive for the nutritional status and the adverse events uh, for a ketogenic diet, 
mixed results observed for blood parameters, tumor effects, and quality of life, um, but also that the diet adherence um, did range considerably. Uh, and that is oftentimes, I think, what is the most challenging factor for a ketogenic diet is being able to truly adhere uh, to this diet. Um, and just a couple trials, this is one that was even published just last month, looking at the majority, saying in the summary kind of the majority of preclinical and several clinical studies argue for the use of the ketogenic diet in combination with standard therapies. Just to note, this is not a ketogenic diet is not using instead of your standard therapies, but as an adjunctive, as an adjunctive uh, therapy to the standard chemotherapies, radiation therapies. Um, based on its potential anti-tumor effects of classic chemo and radi radiotherapy, its overall good safety, tolerability, increased quality of life. However, we need to have basically more research. Um, but yet it's showing, okay, this could be a, this could be a possibility that we should be you know, consider, continuing to study and that we may want to be considering for patients to utilize. Additionally, this study uh, published in February of this year showing that targeting the metabolic pathway of glioblastomas via glycolytic inhibition in conjunction with the ketogenic diet or exogenous ketone body supplementation warrants further investigations as a promising adjunctive treatment to conventional therapy. Um, just to clarify, exogenous ketone body supplementation, some big words there, but basically it means that you're probably taking ketone supplements that you're not making yourself, but that you're taking in exogenously. You're taking them in from the outside. So ketogenic diets within uh, cancer treatment, therapeutic mechanisms of action of this high fat, moderate to low protein, that's gonna depend if you're following kind of the modified ketogenic diet or the standard classic one, and definitely a very low carbohydrate diet could possibly influence cancer treatment and prognosis. Um, the idea being maybe in a favorable manner. Um, challenges that have included a lack of standardized diets within clinical trials uh, and also lack of consistent monitoring of glucose and ketones. Uh, this is a challenging diet to pursue and to be able to maintain, particularly um, if we're fatigued and have um, you know, challenges in terms of our various day-to-day you know, -day functioning. Uh, we do know that a ketogenic diet can be started and maintained without the need for hospitalization. The preparation, the palatability of the food can be challenging, um, but, that's, but not necessarily not doable. Um, this particularly is challenging, I find, if we're lacking some of our executive functioning skills and just fatigue. Um, I find generally, you know, fatigue being the overriding number one, you know, symptom side effect of treatments um, and patients ketogenic or not, just simply trying to fuel one in a healthy way can be very challenging um, when, you know, so fatigued. Um, hospitalization in an acute or chronic care facility can be a challenge as if you're trying to follow that and you're in the hospital setting, they're generally not quite equipped to provide a true ketogenic diet that would include the strict weighing of the food and monitoring things. There could be certain exceptions to that, but in general, the standard hospitals are probably not able to keep one in a you know, classic ketogenic diet um, you know, during their hospitalization. Uh, and then lastly there, we do need to make sure that we are monitoring blood glucose and also ketones frequently to make sure that you stay in a state of ketone, ketosis and also that glucose is uh, in a good balanced state. So there are a lot of potential reasons we may want to consider utilizing um, a ketogenic diet as we've illustrated tonight, but I also want to just point out that if you're listening to this and thinking, I don't know that I can follow this, I'm not sure I can really monitor and measure my ketones uh, and do that, number one, Chad's going to talk about how he was able to do that, and that could be um, helpful, and certainly we can have questions at the end. But even beyond the ketogenic diet, if that's just simply too much, then I would say just make sure you're eating healthfully. You want to take this time for all of us, cancer or no cancer, to really be nourishing ourselves to our fullest. And typically, I like to see that half that plate is filled with vegetables. Um, probably a little bit of fruit, but I want to see oftentimes triple the amount of vegetables than fruits. Uh, and then we want to definitely make sure that we have protein included in all of our meals. It doesn't need to be in this little bento box exactly, but just the idea that 
uh, protein is being included. That could be uh, pr a plant protein, which we like to be able to incorporate. Um, and then maybe also incorporating some lean animal protein sources. Um, and then again, not necessarily if one is following a ketogenic diet, but possibly looking at um, using healthy, high, you know, higher carbohydrate vegetables like sweet potatoes and butternut squash and things like that. And also, you know, healthy whole grains like quinoa or amaranth or brown rice or wild rice, things of that sort. Um, and then making sure that we're, you know, are incorporating some healthy, high quality fats, avocado, nuts and seeds, olive oil, avocado oil, um, cold water fish, flax seeds, chia seeds, you know, that are going to be rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Those are going to all be, you know, things you want to just keep in mind, you know, in general. So I just included this slide not to deter or encourage one way or the other, but more so that if you're feeling overwhelmed, that I really want to make sure that number one, that you're fueling your system as healthfully as possible and that we can go about this in a few different ways. Um, and, you know, I uh, definitely am still with UCSF um, and I will um, show that in a moment, but before I jump into um, kind of how you could go about scheduling appointments, I wanted to um, share a few resources. Uh, it seems like the Charlie Foundation has the most significant amount of uh, information online that you could kind of look at to get more information for the ketogenic diet. Um, I also was looking at a variety of different apps um, and kind of rating these kind of highest to lowest, included there the Carb Manager, uh, the Ketogenic Diet, 8Fit, Ketogenic Diet Plan, and Keto.app. We do not, have, of course, have to use an app. These are just some options to have at your fingertips. And I understand um, Chad found the Keto for Cancer book very helpful. Um, I have not read that, but definitely could be another one we want to consider um, reading and discussing. We can talk about that too in um, Chad's segment. Um, and and then certainly there could be more and more you know types of um, resources. The Keto Calculator, I think, is you can find on the charliefoundation.org's website. And then if you're interested in kind of pursuing this further, um, for those that are, you know, UCSF um, cancer uh, patients, you can uh, make a schedule nutrition appointments with Greta McCare or Lisa Ploss. Um, you can see there, there is the phone number down there in the bottom right. And I think if I do this, maybe you'll see the arrow, perfect. Um, give them, you know, the call to be able to schedule appointments. Um, and, you know, and we could be able to kind of work so you have somebody really helping you through this step by step um, to make sure that you're in a good position to be able to follow this, you're following it safely, and that you're able to do that um, with your medical, your medical team on board so that they're aware of what you're doing um, to make sure that you're in the safest and healthiest scenario. Uh, and before we open up to questions, I'm going to pass this on now to Chad to speak on his perspective and following the ketogenic diet. Chad. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. All right, great. Thanks, uh, Naomi and Alexa, for inviting me to join. I give my disclaimer that I didn't prepare things in nearly as an organized fashion as Natalie's. I certainly appreciate these slides and um, I wish I could have them sooner, but now that I do have them, I'm definitely gonna refer to them more. So um, I'll just spend a, a little bit of time talking about why I chose the keto diet, a little bit of my own personal path of getting here, which is um, interesting to say the least for me. Um, uh, just a disclaimer for everybody, I'm certainly no expert. I've only been on this journey for about, um, uh, I guess it'd be about eight months in total. Um, and my actual keto diet has really only been in rigorous uh, uh, form for about five, five of those months. So, but a little bit about uh, why I chose the keto, how I got to where I am today. And, um, and where I'm at now. Um, initially, I knew nothing about the ketogenic diet. In fact, even from a, you know, an athletic perspective or people that have chosen any kind of diet, I, I knew nothing about it. Um, I had actually never even heard of it. Um, 
uh, it kind of starts, my journey starts like maybe many people on the call at, at my diagnosis uh, shortly after my first two grand mal seizures. Um, long story short, um, I was in the hospital. They confirmed the diagnosis uh, um, by doing my first brain surgery uh, biopsy um, to be an infiltrating uh, distributed neoplasm, also referred to as gliomatosis, um, aka brain cancer. And that, while well, while I was in the hospital, one of the nurses was uh, talking about um, this ketogenic diet, um, and I had already kind of wondered why on the medical questionnaires no one asked me um, what I eat. Um, part of the reason I wondered that is because I was uh, definitely a sugar junkie, um, and I would I would guess that a good uh, seventy percent of my calories, if not more, uh, came from carbohydrates. Um, I've always been an active person, but I've never been a very uh, nutritionally minded person, and I certainly haven't uh, probably had nearly as a well balanced meal as what Natalie just showed um, on one of the slides there. So I wanted to find a little bit more about that, and um, I learned that, of course, the standard of care. It's probably not going to promote necessarily anything that's not uh, study based um, with a lot of studies. And as Natalie mentioned, uh, they're, they're tough. They're tough to get studies around this kind of therapeutic uh, uh, ketogenic uh, diet. I stumbled across a talk online by Dr. Thomas Seafried. He's uh, he works at Boston College and he was talking about the difference between uh, really the metabolic theory of cancer and, and more of the genetic theory of cancer. And this got me really interested because I, I knew that the biopsy that was done was not only to uh, just look at the cell structure, but they'd hoped to really uh, look at the DNA itself and see whether or not it, it, it um, falls in some uh, genetic makeup that's already cataloged within the UCSF uh, catalog. Um, they were unable to get enough um, due to the distributed nature of my uh, brain tumor. And even after a second uh, biopsy, after my second seizure, a couple of months later, they still weren't able to get enough. Um, but that's, that's their main focus, right? Because that helps with prognosis and it also helps with um, uh, potentially choosing which type of therapy um, they, would, they would promote. Um, and so this whole idea of metabolic theory of cancer versus genetic, uh, more of a genetic mutation, really caught my attention because what Dr. Seafried and others were presenting was, maybe we've got this wrong. Maybe the DNA wasn't the problem. It was actually the mitochondria and the cells that created this kind of problem. And eventually uh, things went bad enough, so to speak, in my layman's terms, that the cells start to replicate and pass on that, that uh, genetic mutation to other cells. And that's where I uh, learned about the Warburg effect. And in a nutshell, which uh, Natalie already mentioned, this is really something that's been around for, gosh, 90 years. And Dr. Otto Warburg observed this and um, realized that cancer cancer cells themselves thrive on this uh, on these fermentable fuels right and um, I learned that fermentation itself is a very inefficient source of energy so if you're a cell and you're gonna and you're going to um, utilize uh, glucose for your energy um, you need a lot of it and um, you're gonna do this is my words, by the way, but if I'm a cell and I need a lot of it, I'm going to do everything possible to get more of it. And um, the, the, the blood flow and the, and the um, supply of uh, energy from glucose is going to be what, what I achieve. And in fact, if I'm a true messed up cancer cell, I, I can't even use ketones. Um, I, I, need, I need glucose. And this really, this really caught my attention. And the reason it did is because um, my 
my wonderful team at UCSF, of course, is, is targeting uh, two, two brain biopsies um, in order to identify the genetic mutation itself, um, because that's what we have at our disposal today. Um, and in order to confirm their, their very, very strong hunch of, of my poor prognosis and the fact that this uh, distributed glioma um, uh, will leave me with, with not very much time to live and they can then, um, you know, persuade me to, 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 to go on to a whole brain, um, whole brain radiation, which I was a little skeptical of and, and still have, and I, and I turned that down. Um, so in the case of my brain tumor, they can't go in and remove it. Uh, it will continue to spread. Um, it's like sand. <laughs> it's an astrocytic uh, type tumor, but it, it's, it spreads through the brain passing on this genetic mutation. And uh, the reason I give this kind of long-winded backdrop is because um, like maybe a lot of people, a lot of a lot of people with any kind of diagnosis, to be quite honest, uh, I'm sure a lot of people want to know what they can do. Not everybody, um, but I'm I'm certainly somebody that wanted some sense of control um, after uh, finding out that I don't have a lot of control, and that's what led me to the ketogenic diet, um, and it really it really comes down to me reading about the Warburg effect. So in the beginning, I was very confused about a uh, ketogenic diet. Um, I was uninformed and I basically came home from surgery and stopped eating all carbohydrates. Uh, immediately. Uh, I, I was, I'm laughing at what I did because I pretty much came out of, brain surgery and not only having the side effects from that, like I'm sure many of us do, um, I turned around and told my body, no more sugar that you've been getting every night, no more Ben and Jerry's, no bread, uh, no potatoes, no nothing. Um, and long story short, it ended up in hindsight, I was kind of following more of a modified Atkins diet at that point, a lot of protein, which is not the same thing as a keto diet as Natalie mentioned. And I had a lot of I had a lot of side effects for the first uh, couple of weeks. Um, certainly, the first week I had headaches. Um, over the coming weeks, uh, a lot of weight loss, uh, cravings for food, and a lot of fatigue um, that Natalie mentioned. Um, but that that led me to a book. Uh, quickly realizing I couldn't do this on my own. It led me two places. One is to the Osher Center to uh, talk to an integrative oncologist um, and get some guidance there. And the other one was, was the book that Natalie mentioned, which is Keto for Cancer. Um, I, I highly recommend it um, for, for multiple reasons. It's, it's written by Miriam Kalamian, and she, she does a great job of underscoring something that Natalie mentioned um, several times in our presentation, and that is, um, it's okay to do whatever we can do. And so, if we can't follow some strict regimen, uh, regimen, um, and do things perfectly, that's okay. Um, but if we want to, this book lays out uh, extensively a way to uh, to to decide what's right for us if we want to choose this type of uh, higher fat, low carb diet and um, take it as far as we want. And for me, I guess one of the things I want to drive home for anybody is that that has empowered me to take charge of my diet in ways that I never did before. I may not stay on it forever, but I certainly won't return to um, the way I ate before. Um, so after those challenges, I guess I, I'll just hit on two things. What, what it's like now, for me now, uh, I, I'm probably four months into a very rigorous uh, ketogenic diet. Um, it's easier because I have a routine. Um, the cooking is easier. Um, I have mixed it up with some intermediate fasting every evening. Um, 
I don't eat for anywhere from 12 to 15 hours. I sleep most, you know, good portion of that time anyway. Um, I no longer have any of the challenges I, I mentioned earlier. No headaches. Uh, my, weight, my weight loss steadied off at a normal level. Um, and with the help of an integrative oncologist at Osher Center, we, we found my body weight and we used that to uh, kind of form a plan for what my macronutrient targets uh, could be and should be. Um, I do use an app that makes it easier too. Um, uh, that, that is called the chronometer. There are several other ones, and that's why I was very interested in looking more at the, the slide you had, Natalie, um, that I'd like to look into also. But that's what it's like for me now is that it's, it's routine. Um, and I think more than anything, it gives me, um, uh, I have more energy, which is quite strange until I don't, which is I really associated with uh, the chemotherapy and um, also my anti-seizure medicine. So during the time that I'm not hitting that energy wall, I am just consistent uh, on my energy level. That's in stark contrast to how I was before. I could eat food and have a high energy level and within an hour have a very low energy level. It was very cyclical and I think that what that tells me is my 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 blood sugar was very cyclical and, and now it's probably much more steadied out. And that's probably one of the, the best benefits for me. Another benefit is I can not eat for hours and be fine. And that's not anywhere close to what I what I experienced my entire life. Uh, I ate breakfast and an hour and a half later, I was, I was hungry and my stomach would hurt. I craved so much food. Um, so for me to go in and do fasting, um, which I will be starting tomorrow, uh, I do a three day fast um, every time I do my, my chemo treatment. Um, so again, as kind of an adjunct to the chemo, I, I put myself in more of a fasting state and that's, surprisingly easy. I'm just surprised how easy a water only fast was for me. Um, I couldn't imagine that possible with a normal carbohydrate rich diet like I had before. So um, th those are the changes now that, um, that I'll, I'll mention. And I think I'm at the point now where I need to follow up on micronutrients. Um, I think I probably have some deficiencies there. Um, I'm getting a lot of leg cramps and things like this. Uh, I also want to just throw out there that this isn't the only thing I do. It's just one of many things. And I think uh, one of the words that uh, caught my attention on one of your slides, Natalie, is, was potential. Um, the ketogenic diet and, and this, this, whole thera this whole metabolic uh, theory of cancer, that in fact cancer cells are they're just metabolically messed up. Their, their mitochondria no longer works the way that it should have. Um, those things combined with the potential to do something in addition to uh, the standard of care that, that I'm pursuing with chemotherapy, <clears throat> it really motivates me. And I can't, I can't say that enough. So at that, I forgot to start my stopwatch, so I may have gone over, but I'll, I'll, I'll cut it off there. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Chad, and thank you so much, Natalie. Um, such great information, and I love uh, both of your perspectives on this. Um, so now we're going we're gonna to turn to Q&A. So um, I'll unmute you both, Natalie and, and Chad. And we do have a question. Actually, there's one question I had that um, just came up when Chad was, was talking. And we do have some audience questions as well. But uh, you mentioned the intermittent fasting. And I guess I, I'm curious, as someone who is not as familiar with the ketogenic diet, is that part of the ketogenic diet? Or is that something in addition that you're doing kind of as an adjunct, Chad? And then I'll ask Natalie as well. Uh, I use that as, a, as an adjunct. Natalie certainly can talk to it more, but as she mentioned before, getting to a state of ketosis um, where our body is using uh, these ketone bodies, uh, these ketone, one of these three ketone bodies, but primarily beta hydroxybutyrate, which we can measure in our blood, um, as its primary fuel source can be uh, 
induced or helped with the state of fasting. So I think within 24 hours or maybe 48 hours, there's just no more glucose and no more reserves available and the, and the liver can't do anything more um, with uh, the, the carbohydrates and uh, uh, sugar in our body. And so it starts to move into that that sooner. So the reason I do it is as an adjunct to answer your question. And then I hit, I kind of hit, I, I, I picture kind of uh, stressing out the cancer cells a little bit um, uh, prior to hitting it with a very, a very toxic, uh, obviously chemotherapy. So that's the reason I do it is kind of as an adjunct. Um, Got it. Thank you. And Natalie, do you have anything to add to that? The, the fasting component? For the yeah, I mean, typically I would say that um, fasting would be a separate in issue than ketogenic diet, but certainly could be used in combination. Uh, and some people may opt to do intermittent fasting and not be, you know, following the ketogenic diet. And we definitely need more research in this area as well. But uh, it does seem to be promising at least to make sure that we're getting probably at least 12 hours overnight. Um, some people will kind of push a little more towards that 15 hour, even up to the 16, I find that when we're going to the 16, 18 hour fast, it's, you just, it's hard to meet your nutrient needs if you're only eating in a, you know, eight, you know, six to eight hour window. But I think having a, you know, 12 to 15 hour fast overnight um, and then, you know, being able to get, you can definitely meet your nutrient needs. I would also say that sometimes I find that it's common that people are like, oh yeah, I eat up until you know, you have dinner at nine o'clock at night. And I just don't eat again until, you know, one o'clock the next day. And I would say much healthier would be to end your day sooner and start your eating earlier, you know, the next day. Um, you know, so if we could end by, you know, four, five, six o'clock at night and then resume at kind of a more, you know, nine, 10, so that if you're really being active, but I think to wake up and again, now who knows what time people are waking up with uh, shelter in place. But in general, like if you're waking up at even an average of 7 a.m. and not eating until one, I don't think that that is really metabolically healthy for one and definitely not going to really be fueling somebody most appropriately. And particularly if somebody's trying to exercise in the morning and then not eat anything for hours afterwards, I think right. it's healthier to be able to eat sooner, but then end you know, possibly a little bit, so that when you're sleeping, you're not working on digesting so much there. And then I also add with the fasting around chemo, that's another another component separate even of intermittent fasting, um, that research is certainly, you know, too new to be able to say, oh, everyone should be doing this. But it is most definitely intriguing data that I suggest for patients to consider, you know, as an option. And oftentimes what I will do for patients who are not you know, following ketogenic diet, which is most everyone um, that I that I typically see, uh, is not necessarily do a full fast because sometimes I'm finding patients. I've had a few patients who can do that, but oftentimes I'm finding patients are um, really irritable uh, <laughs> when they're coming in uh, for treatment, and they're they're like too weak to really be able to drive them. You know, kind of be able to move around. And if they have young children at home, it's all too much. So instead of being for, set of, for those patients, rather than doing a full fast for those three days around chemo, instead, I've said, hey, why don't you just keep the carbohydrates particularly low? Try to keep the carbohydrates of under 50 grams for those three days you know, around your chemo to, as, a, as a kind of a maybe a little bit more of a you know, doable you know, option. So certainly lots of different ways um, that you could kind of tailor this. Chad's going full throttle, I would say. So like, you know, not everyone's able to achieve the ketogenic diet and do intermittent fasting and do the three-day fasting. So kudos to you, Chad, for being able to do that. It's, there's a lot of willpower that's needed to do that. And um, I definitely would want to acknowledge that um, most definitely. And just so that if you're a patient listening and kind of thinking, I don't think I can even do that. One, you may be surprised at what you can do, but two, we can certainly do variations you know, and then if you decide you're later down the road ready for something, that could be a different scenario. But don't feel that you're failing or feel guilty just because you're not doing something, you know, all the way, you know, in terms of the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting, you know, and the fasting piece. But lots of lots, you know, lots of things to definitely consider. Yeah. Chad, if I may, do you measure then do you measure your ketones via blood at this point, or do you now just kind of know how you're feeling after so many months or um I I'm 
just coming off a more rigorous uh, blood testing just because I've been kind of trying to geek out what my what my glycemic index looks like throughout the day and around meals and stuff. So mm -hmm. I do use the precision extra um, to give me, uh, you know, my ketone levels. And then I have a different one that's a little cheaper strips for just glucose it made by one to one touch ultra. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what gives me the, the guide and I'm, I'm, I'm relaxing that now. Um, I think that's one of the nicer parts now is I'm able to eat and know what's, you know, what's the actual effect on my body, um, within the blood, within whatever the, the error, the, the percent error is on measuring it. So, um, yeah, I typically have been between 0.7 and, uh, 2.0 on the on the millim millimolar mm -hmm. scale for ketones um uh that it's never been above two interestingly enough um but that's kind of where i that's where i am right now with measuring my blood got it okay great uh, quick question for you uh natalie since since you brought it up this this idea of fasting around or even modifying our diets around chemo treatment um I, i've never not uh, fasted my first chemo was during a, a, a fast and so I'm not really sure but does it affect or help with uh, with nausea because it's not something I've experienced a lot of and I wonder if you've seen well, that that has any help I haven't seen enough patients who are truly you know fasting keeping it low that um, you know, where we saw like a difference, like, oh, they had nausea, then we did no, then we did fasting and then they didn't. That I find a lot of that depends on obviously the tumor, the tumor type and kind of what's going on and definitely the chemotherapy itself. Okay. Um, and historically, I mean, like years ago, my fear was people were going to feel particularly nauseous by fasting, but, um, the patients who I've had who have fasted or fasted primary, you know, even had gone really low carb, I will say those patients, even before they were doing the fasting piece, I think just were feeling really, really well. Uh, they were doing, you know, some harsh chemos, but they were, they just, their system was so prepped from all the things that they were doing, fueling their body appropriately, sleeping, act, being active, you know, mindfulness, kind of all the different pieces that I think that yeah. they just fortunately were able to go through chemo, um, you know, not that, you know, pretty, you know, very and tolerate it very well. So okay. I haven't necessarily seen that it helps or hinders nausea, at least yet. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you both. So we do have some questions that have come in that Q&A. Natalie, do you mind um, um, advancing the slide just so people can see? Oh, sorry. Uh, just, that's okay. Just to <laughs> remind and use the Q&A function if you do want to submit a question. But we do have a few that are here right now, and I'm just going to go through them and answer, ask them. Um, so what do you think about the vegan ketogenic diet? Um, and this person quote, uh, mentions Dr. Carrie Dioulas and Dr. Ethan Weiss. Um, maybe I'll, I'll address that to you, Natalie. Sure. Um, I don't know those physicians, um, but I would say that it's possible. The vegan ketogenic diet is a very, ch you know, ketogenic diet itself, very challenging. Um, so, the vegan diet, I have no issues in terms of getting the proper fats. In fact, I like actually, you know, the vegan fats more than I really want to have any, you know, a lot of the animal fats and so forth in there. So that I don't think is the concern. The challenge with the vegan ketogenic diet is if you're going to get, depends on what, if you're doing classic and you're only getting 8% you know, calories from protein probably would be doable. But if you're trying to get 20% of your calories from protein, yet keep your carbohydrates at 10% or, uh, you know, 10%, following your standard foods, vegan proteins are primarily going to be beans and legumes uh, and soy. And so sometimes people either don't tolerate soy or they're not using it for, you know, one reason or another. Um, but that could be, you know, one of the sources, possibly tofu, tempeh, um, where would, would give not quite as many in terms of the carbohydrates, but any place basically that you're having protein, you're going to get carbohydrates. So it's, it can be challenging that way because the vegan proteins are going to include carbohydrates. And so you have to be very careful of, of measuring that way. You could also do 
you know, and I, again, I typically want to support more food, more so than powder and pills as much as I can, but I definitely utilize supplements. I definitely utilize protein powders and so forth for patients. And certainly I would think that a vegan protein powder would probably be essential to be able to make that happen so that you really could get something that would give 20, 25 grams of protein, for example, and not provide any carbohydrates. That would probably be the way that you're doing that because you're not going to, you know, you're going to, you're going to get a little bit from your vegetables in terms of the protein, but for your primary protein sources, I think it can be done. It just is, you know, it can be challenging. Thank you. Okay. There's another question around potatoes. Is potato not allowed in the keto diet? I'd say that you're typically, if you're eating potatoes, your carbohydrates are going to go too high. So, I mean, you may be able to figure out a way to watch everything and eat a little baby potato, you know, and still be at 10%. Uh, but in general, your starchy vegetables, your grains and things like that, they're going to be out because you're going to get carbohydrates even a little bit with your vegetables. Uh, if you are, you know, eating beans and legumes or, you know, you're probably going to get some protein, excuse me, some carbohydrates in with those. So I'm not saying it couldn't be done. It would be very challenging to be done. You'd have to definitely modify other factors to make sure if you really were trying to include that potato in that for, for a uh, ketogenic diet. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. I have another question here for Chad. Um, have you seen any effect um, on your tumor condition after going keto? Any, any changes in MRIs so far? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. I, I actually have only been through uh, two rounds of, of chemo treatment uh, in addition to this ketogenic diet and only one MRI. I opted not to do my last MRI just because uh, that would have been due two weeks ago um, up at UCSF, and I didn't want to, my neutrophils and white blood cells were so low that I just didn't want to risk uh, being exposed to coronavirus. So um, to answer your question, the first MRI showed um, uh, no growth, which was um, good news, uh, maybe a little bit surprising because they, they like I said before, they, they do believe it's highly aggressive. Um, but they've been unable to confirm what they need to confirm with the genetic testing because unfortunately they just didn't get enough cells there to confirm, confirm it. So um, as of now, I can't tell you any more than there was no growth on that MRI about eight weeks ago, and I skipped this one, and so we'll see what happens in another eight weeks. Thank you. Um, all right, so I see another question here for you, Natalie. It's a comment about uh, I'm just going to read it out. I think personally that the benefits from the, from a modified keto diet after treatment is more from the added issues that we deal with as patients, increased risks of strokes, heart attacks, secondary cancers, et cetera, than as a cancer treatment per se. Any thoughts about this perspective? I would say in terms of, you know, ketogenic diets, I don't think has any impact necessarily on secondary cancers and so forth. And certainly treatment could have you know, uh, and some negative effects, you know, with time, um, both acute and chronic. But uh, I, yeah, I think in terms of the research here, some of this is definitely looking at oncology, but this is also looking at ketogenic diet overall, that we know we still need to make sure we're very closely monitoring kidneys and just kind of watching, you know, liver, making sure the blood sugar is staying stable. And in terms of the um, altered microbiome, treatment or no treatment, I think just that we'd want to make sure that we're looking at a variety of factors and possibly somebody like this, you know, ketogenic diet is really helping to control my cancer. Then it may be like, well, obviously that's going to take precedent over, you know, possibly having a, you know, altered microbiome, but we may say, let's make sure we add certain components to the diet then or supplement wise to help improve the, you know, the health of your microbiome so that it can stay in a balanced state and not be, you know, not be dysbiotic. Yeah. Can I, can I add to that, uh, Natalie? Sure. Um, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I, um, I would say from the perspective of, um, my own individual prognosis, um, for now, I, I'm not personally too concerned with the, um, Long, potential long-term uh, effects of having done a, a strict ketogenic diet. And I don't know that I will maintain it forever. Um, but certainly 
like you said, the, the long-term part of it will be something that um, I will be more than happy to address, <laughs> I guess is what is my take on. So the, the microbiome stuff you mentioned, and like I, I'm wondering about my micronutrients and some other things that are happening there. There are things that I, I look forward to addressing, um, even if that means going back to more of a well-balanced uh, diet like you mentioned before. Um, so I think I'm stating the same thing as you did, but um, from kind of a perspective of when I started a ketogenic diet, um, you know, these risks that we hear about uh, for me were nothing. They, they pale in comparison to, to, to how many, uh, the number of months they, they thought I, I would be around. And so in the short term, it, for me, it's been a real, um, uh, like I said before, a real tool to keep positive and move, move, take charge of, of, of my, my life in addition to other adjunct therapies too. So, but yeah, I do, I'm concerned about the long-term stuff and I, um, I, I want to make sure that uh, I keep a, an eye on that. And I definitely promote anybody uh, consulting with uh, people like you or other integrative oncologists and stuff to help, track that because it's not something that uh we can probably do alone or at least i can't so great yeah and you wouldn't expect a patient to be able to you know know how to monitor these things which things to be monitoring specifically uh and i do think that it's it's everything's relative right so um altered microbiome even renal issues if um you know if you're alive and stable, that is going to, you know, that's fantastic. And that's going to be a question versus somebody who's just saying, Oh, I want to lose weight, no cancer. I'm just looking to doing this for years and years. It, you know, again, it's all going to be individual based on what is, you know, one person's situation may, you know, is. So right. absolutely. That makes sense. So first, just like, can I get this under control? Then I'll deal with trying to monitor if I'm going to be doing this for a longer period of time, what would possibly be some of the consequences and how do I help to, you know, assuage those so that they're not an issue. Right. Um, right. Kidney stones and the things you mentioned. Uh, yeah. yeah. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much to our panelists um, for being here and for all your wonderful information. And thank you all for joining us. I, we all wish you so, so much health and happiness and um, wellness on this journey. Thank you. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, Alexa. Thank you, Naomi.